muscles need to uh, be rested and your ear muscles exercised. <laughs> what? What? So this afternoon we have two really interesting speakers. This morning we had some very interesting speakers too. And uh, we hope that this continues and Chris is not going to let us down and we'll provide something interest. Chris, you're not allowed to talk about ATUs. Okay. With that agreement, I think we should just get underway. But let me remind you that the raffle, you've had your chances to buy a ticket. If you haven't bought it now, sorry, it's closed. We'll draw the raffle at the close of the day after the two speakers. And the draw will be simple, by colour, a list of numbers. If you hear your colour and your number, go to the back. Your prize will have the stub of your ticket on it. See Gavin and he will allow you to take it. <laughs> if you don't produce your stub, your side of the ticket, uh, he may not allow you. Also remember all the books on the left, they're going in the skip if they don't go with your car or with you in your bag or something. Please just feel free to go and lift the books on the left because those are free. Remember also that there's some merchandise out the front. If you haven't already put your name on the table plan, please do so. There's a table plan uh, out at the, at the top of the stairs here for those that are staying for the dinner. If you have any special dietary requirements and haven't yet talked to Sherry, please go and do so, maybe even now, uh, if, you, if you need to. So without further ado, Chris, who has helped us out in the past, but this time, at rather short notice, stepped in because somebody else caught a bug or a virus and couldn't be with us. Uh, and Chris, who we had asked to be a little bit on standby, stepped in at the last minute. And so, over to you, Chris. Listening. Um, I, what? I can't hear what you're saying. Um, I've got this radio mic on. I hope you can hear it at the back. Is it okay? That means it doesn't have the QSB. Um, I've done quite a few talks here at GMDX, so I thought, what have I talked about in the past? So I contacted Gavin and El Supremo and asked them, what talks did I give? And they said, we can't remember either. <laughs> <laughs> and they, said, they also said, it doesn't matter, these old buggers won't remember. So there you go. <laughs> so here we go. This is, a, this is a slight variation of a talk that I gave at the RSGB convention. Slightly rejigged a little bit. A um, couple of things before we start. My original talks here at GMDX were 14 point uh, script. Now I've gone to 36 point bold. <laughs> So, <laughs> <good one. laughs> very good. Uh, okay, another final sort of admin point. This time in the afternoon, you've all had a, a, a swally at lunchtime. You've had a big lunch. The talks are starting to drone on. There's a danger of sleep. So I want you to keep an idea, a careful eye on your neighbour. <laughs> Keep on a careful eye on your neighbour and uh, make sure they don't fall asleep. Anyone suspected of sleeping during this talk? <laughs> okay, so keep an eye. If you see anyone sleeping, let me know. Okay, um, I'm going to start way back over 100 years ago with uh, very early days. And uh, I've got about roughly 40 slides. Please feel free to interrupt at any time with a question and anything I'm not clear about, hard luck, because as a, an ex-teacher, I can talk authoritatively for hours about subjects I know virtually nothing about. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. So 120 years ago, the spark got pretty crude sort of technology, uh, then the diode, then onto crystal detectors, the triode with the extra grid element coming in. World War I was pretty grim with radios tuned radio frequency receivers, very low power, drifting all over the place, quite poor, really quite poor. In the late 1920s, am I doing something wrong, John? Am just, I just speak up a bit, so I can tell the audience. Speak up a bit, I'll try. Um, late 1920s, the super heck receiver, everything 
separate. Everything was AM and CW, obviously, although SSB had been developed quite early on. Um, one notable battle near the end of World War II, the Battle of Arnhem, was really blighted by poor radio communications. They were tuning up these radios in the UK. They were putting them onto planes or gliders, tossing them out on a parachute. As soon as they hit the ground, the QSY 10 KCs. And <laughs> of course, in that, in the, the situation was very, very bad. And uh, a lot of problems during the war were due to uh, poor communication between units, especially in World War One, really quite terrible. Uh, a guy called Jeff Nock, uh, G4BXD, has got a very interesting page about the Battle of Arnhem, and there's a lot more on this American site from AB4OJ. So if you're interested in the wartime use of radios, um, these are two sites that are really well worth going to. Um, about seven or eight years ago, I brought a rad one of these radios along to this convention, and it was set up through there, and we had an FTDX 9000. Uh, you remember that, uh, Fred? We had the QSO with this thing to an FTDX 9000. So um, this is a very interesting radio. I brought one home from New Zealand when we lived there. Basically, the sort of uh, Far Eastern 19 set. For its day, it had some very interesting features. Um, I've just made it, there's the inside. I'll just come back to the previous side, slide. Uh, two VFOs, so you could work split. Um, an, aerial, <laughs> an aerial tuning unit. Uh, I'll just put it forward to this. This is from nearly 80 years ago. It had these features. Two VFOs, two modes. You could do AM or CW. It had two preset memories, which were actually mechanical memories. The, the, you turned the dial and it sort of went clunk to that frequency. You press the key and it goes on to transmit. Great big wide relay contacts, but it does it, and it's got a built-in ATU. So all of these features we take for granted in a 2022 transceiver were there nearly 80 years ago. Quite amazing. Easy field servicing, remote control, not quite in your league, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, very easy field servicing because the box, the spare, the big crate evolves uh, only four different types, but you needed to be incredibly strong, squaddy. For heaven's sake, the ground station. Uh, <laughs> so 200 and a quarter of a ton almost, and for two for 1.5 watts output. <laughs> Terrible. Ma maximum range, uh, maybe 15 miles. They reckon the, the handbook says on a good day you can get. Uh, 25 miles. I bought a little U kit, so it's only 400 grams. A lot of people think these are rubbish. But I quite like it. It actually works stations. Am I not doing well with this microphone, John? No, you're okay. You sure? Well, yeah. You were glaring at me there, I could no, tell. No, no. All right. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, only four. So, are you imagine for you could carry 600 U kits, HB1Bs, <laughs> and, and with a two and a half times the power for the weight of one ZC1 Mark II field station, and there's a little picture of it set up. Doesn't look like a very wartime scene, if you don't mind me saying. Looks more like some idyllic New Zealand meadow. Okay, <laughs> moving on. So that's World War II. Um, they had this very strange diagram in the handbook. I was looking at this thinking, what the hell is this? This is how to tune in to zero beat. So very close to zero beat, you get a grunt <laughs> and then, then you get a low whistle, and then you get a shrill whistle, and then you get silence. So that's the sort of book, the information that the squaddies were given to operate these World War II radios. Uh, Tom, were you late arriving at the talk? No, we're here all the time. Oh, very quiet, Tom. Are you all right? <laughs> <laughs> away from the speaker a bit. Is it that speaker? Yeah. In 70 years we've had a lot of money.
Hello, are you copying B? Yeah. Great. Here's some of the ones. Quite a few of these have gone via prompt. Uh, obviously, the older American ones like Hammerland, uh, Halligram, <laughs> It's very difficult. Well, are you trying to silence? I'm doing my best, but I keep on. Are you trying to silence the Alexa now? No, I'm doing my best, but there just isn't enough audio. You need to talk. Need, you're a teacher. You should be able to speak up. Yes, you can. Just take the best and we'll try shouting. Yeah. No, because then I won't get it on the video. <laughs> Have you done a better mic that actually works? Sure. Are you copying me at the back? No, no. no. This is working perfectly. This is all time wasting, by the way, because my talk's are a bit short. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's up with you, John? I didn't think there was any problem. Well, they were all working earlier, so I'm not. That's off now. I've turned that off. So. Well, you can do, yeah, but. It's, uh, you're, you're speaking ever so quiet. Uh, I've got to turn up the audio. So. One, two, three, test, one, two, three. Oh, that's fine, isn't it? There you go. It, it's working all the time. It's just it's so close to those speakers over there, so... Hang on a second. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure you recognise some of the names on this list. Uh, ICOM used to be called Inui. Kenwood used to be called Trio. They've survived quite well. I remember buying a Frontier Electronics FE600 transceiver. Fred, do you know them? The what you've got one, yeah. the worst radio you could imagine, every possible fault. Um, some nice old souls there, like the Swan. I had a Swan 700 CX, 750 watts input in the one box. I've come on to some of more ra modern ones, Flex Radio, Elecraft, and of course there's a host of little manufacturers. One of the guys in our club has bought an FT8 only transceiver from uh, Hans Summers, what they called the uh, QCA. No, um, QRP kits, and it's supposed to be data only. It doesn't even do CW or anything else. So there we go. Um, right, moving on. So that's last 70 years of the amateur radio market. Some more developments. In 1947, the first transistors came along and the MOSFET. Uh, crystal filters were patented uh, well, in early 1900 years ago. Mechanical filters... SSB was first patented way back in 1915. A lot of things in our hobby are military spin-offs where there's millions of dollars available for the development. Uh, things like digital signal, DSP, direct dig digital signal uh, synthesizers, etc. Around about 1978, we saw the first, uh, one of the first all solid state tr transceivers, the Drake TR7, I had one. Uh, I, uh, at one time, I had 27 transceivers, and I thought, this is excessive, so I'm now down to nine. <laughs> so if anybody wants to buy a transceiver, just see me at the end of this lecture. Um, the Drake TR7 used a rather clunky synthesizer, but it did work. The real amateur market, DSP, started to show up around about 1996, mid-90s, with the 1000 MP and the tri Kenwood TS870S. A really nice radio, the 870S on CW, it's beautiful. I don't know why they're not more popular, just a limited production, I suppose. Then we got software-defined radios from about 1995, and then more recently, or always been in the pipeline, direct, uh, direct sampling SDR, and then even more recently, the so-called hybrid SDR technology. So on that screen, there's a, a wealth of change from very basic rough equipment through to ultra-modern stuff. Uh, just a few or five slides about the history of the Collins Radio Company. Art Collins there was friendly with a number of the guys in the American military. And uh, at the time, the military were all using AM, and it was pretty duff. They were talking about World War II here, 1940, 41, 42, etc. So this was the... Well, that's 1955, early on from that, sorry. Uh, there's the so-called the 75A4 
uh, I think it's, I uh, can't read it, but the matching transmitter. Each of them would give you a hernia because they're so heavy, and but they're very beautiful. If you ever see one close up, they're really beautiful pieces of equipment. Uh, where are we going here? So, to, in order to mesmerize the U.S. military into buying products from his company, Art Collins uh, got them to install SSB radio on the C-97 Stratocruiser, and they flew 15,000 miles using SSB out over the Pacific to talk back to the headquarters at Strategic Air Command. The, the demonstration was a resounding success and led to huge military orders for SSB radio from then on. And uh, one of the most famous ones, of course, is the Collins KWM-1. Is Ken here? I'm looking for Ken. Ken, did they have one of these when you were pl in your plane? They did. He's nodding. Under the Official Secrets Act, he's not actually <laughs> able to... to <laughs> <laughs> Really? Yeah. Yes. Um, I've only been to Dayton once in 2018, and I saw one of these on a stall. They were wanting $700 for it, and I was going to buy it straight away, but then I thought, oh, hang on a minute, that would be transceiver number 28. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, possibly, yeah. But very beautiful wee radio used in the U-2 spy planes and many other uses. Uh, really the first real amateur transceive. Would you agree, Fred, the, the, the proper use of um, transmit and receive in the one box? The KWM1. Uh, oh, yes. So that I didn't write this. These, these are stolen slides. Because uh, if I'd had more time to prepare, I would have put my call sign at the top and pretended I'd made them up. <laughs> but they're just downloaded. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, okay. Stuart, where's Stuart? A -F -F. Stuart, would you mind telling the assembly your brief story about how you got your 30S1? <laughs> no, okay, well, um, I was involved in the Falklands and uh, I was a helicopter pilot and I flew into South Georgia just after the white flag went up and I picked my way through a minefield around the side of Gritviken, and I came to what the SAS had done with all the bombs that they found and all the weapons they found. They put them inside, effectively, a bomb dump surrounded by uh, um, fence stuff that they'd found lying around. And I saw one of those lying on its side, holding the gate closed. So... <laughs> So I turned around uh, in a, uh, and stood up in my officer fashion and said to these three or four Royal Marines beside me, get that thing to the ship. <laughs> so so they, they did, and they, they hauled it up a rope ladder up the side of the ship, 23 feet up, four guys around it on the ladder. And if you've ever had to lift one of those with the transformer installed, you'll know it's 85 pounds, I think. And uh, it, it's now sitting in my shack. And... Uh, <laughs> yes, th thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, I had the occasion to do a little bit of work on Stuart's amplifier. It was interesting, the only coils that have been adjusted, the Official Secrets Act doesn't apply to me, by the way. Uh, the, uh, speak up. The, um, the only coils that had been adjusted, as far as I could see, were the 15 meter ones. It had been retuned from 15, from 21 megs onto about 22 megs, presumably for comms back to uh, the base, the mainland. Okay, thank you, Stuart, for that unexpected <laughs> talk. Uh, right, moving on a wee bit, a successful UK company based down in Kent. This radio here is from about 1963, uh, the KW2000. This was my first transceiver. Uh, in 1971, and it was a real step change from the old uh, Panda Cub and R107, I think, that I had. Uh, I once got a citation from uh, the FCC for being on 13999, and of course, being a wee schoolboy, I just, I don't know, I don't know, and I got away with it. A, a post office guy arrived with this pink slip, 
but he was very good. I brought one along for you to have a look at, uh, a 2000. This is the so-called duck egg blue pre pre um, pre uh, pre G line case. You can have a wee look. And it took me about six years of looking to get my mitts on one of them because they're they're quite rare nowadays. Uh, moving on a bit, so that's 1963. Uh -huh. There's the there's the circuit uh, the block diagram. Very very simple. Very easy to work on these old radios. You can see the components. That's always a bonus. You can uh, you can tell what they're supposed to be, and you can have an idea of their function in the circuit. Later on, I've got a slide with the s block diagram of the FTDX 101. So be keep that in mind, and you'll see the 101 coming up soon. There's the crystal filter. Uh, that was uh, made in Japan by a company called Kokosai, and they've got a notorious problem. They're very good, very good shape factor when they're new, but with age, they deteriorate like that. So the center there is the mechanical filter element from left to right, and all that gunge is the foam that the Japanese uh, surrounded it with 50 or 60 years ago, 70 years ago when they were manufacturing. So you just clean out all the foam. If you're lucky, the, uh, the element is intact and the wires are still connected and the shape factor of the filter is really quite good when it's good. It's got about six or eight dB loss, so it's not quite a lot of loss. Um, this is the business. If you ever get your mitts on one of these, you're really amazing. Um, the, um, as a little schoolboy, I was 14 in 1965. You, you got your, um, your RADCOM or your, somebody gave you a QST and you saw this and you thought, holy smoke. They did a smaller version, the SR400 Cyclone, but this is the ultimate HF radio all in the one box. It comes with a great big power supply and an external VFO. What do you think the 2000 stands for? What's input? input. input. Yeah. So there's the PA stage. It uses these 8122 tubes, which are rather rare nowadays, but you can still get them. So 2,000 watts in a one-box transceiver. Wonderful. Just what you need. Um, you happy? Uh, by the way, interrupt at any time if you want to disagree or ask a question. Uh, moving on, this is, I brought along an example of this as well. This is really what killed the UK amateur radio industry because only three years later, the Japanese were producing this hybrid transceiver. It's got a built-in DC power supply, two germanium transistors on the back. It, um, it did everything you wanted, and although it was quite expensive initially, uh, it was a world apart from, there's only two years difference between these two radios. So this is the FTDX 150, which is the same. Interestingly, they, they were selling it under the name Yezu. It was just after the war, so they thought, hmm, people might not like a Japanese name. So what did they call it? The summer camp. After <laughs> a German name or a Dutch name. So something wrong with their thinking there from one extreme to another. So I brought a sample of that along. You can have a look at them both. There's only two years apart in their manufacture, and there's a, a, a really much big difference in technology. Um, okay. Yes, precisely, in terms of the transistors inside. Okay, moving on a bit more modern stuff. I'm sure you're all fed up with that valve stuff. So it's such boring old rubbish, isn't it? So it's last, so last century. We've got a, Tom, don't, don't agree, Tom. Tom. Tom, you're not allowed to speak during this talk. Yeah, okay. I know. Right. Uh, moving on, uh, this is a, a chart that I found online from Ellicraft. Ellicraft are a very interesting company. The two guys basically in California with an origin in the QRP world. So when they got on to developing radios like the K3, they really weren't very sure about how to do it. The K3 has got some very odd features. For example, every other radio I've owned has always had a, so a little phono socket on the back marked linear or linear out. In other words, a set of contacts that go to ground when you put this radio on to transmit. And the K3 has a socket marked key, but it's not actually the same thing as PTT out. It's a subtly different m uh, way of doing it. 
Um, so that's, that's the sort of origin of Ellicraft rigs. I've never heard of a Safari 4 or a... Fred, have you got one of them? You're the How many radios have you got in your collection, Fred? No, oh, don't lie, Fred. <laughs> no, c c li li lying in public is embarrassing. H how, many have you <laughs> how many have you got, Fred? Maybe it's about 20. What? It's about 20. Lying again. <laughs> 20 in one cupboard, more like. Um, OK, moving on. Um, so this was in 2008. It was used, first of all, on a VP, I think a Ducey Island expedition. My memory is getting a bit worse. VP6DX, and some of the operators came back and said, we're, not, we're a nice radio, but there seems to be mush on the pileups. So the jury was out about this for a great number of years. Ellicraft really didn't do anything significantly to try and cure the mush. Uh, presumably, they'd had hundreds and hundreds of motherboards made. But last year, at GR2HQ, I had the opportunity to use a K3S, a visiting operator, very different radio much, much better, much quieter. They've reworked the, the main board, the tracks on the main board to reduce the inter, inter sort of internally generated noise. So if you ever get your mitts on a, a K3S, don't sell it, because they're not making them anymore. So who, who's muttering, who's the K3S owner, anybody? No, no hands going up. Okay, but very nice radio. K3, I've got a K3. Yeah, yeah, it's K3. No. Sorry. <laughs> well, worth a try, Terry, but no. No, the, the new synthesizer helped. Uh, they did some other workarounds, but the basic problem was the layout of the, the motherboard, I think. And, uh, you know, the tracking, uh, and they just couldn't do that economically. And then they started to have the component supply issues, which I think was the end of the K3. And they just couldn't get the bits, but we'll see. Uh, okay, in 2015, seven years ago, ICOM came out with this best-selling radio, the 7300. Excellent radio. We've used one in an expedition. It does fall over a bit. If my super... S this, is, this is the only slide graphic that you're going to see here. You've got to see what's happening. The wee... The wee, the wee it's being overloaded. The wee uh, overload light is flashing indicating that the direct sampling is not coping with things. And that happens at minus 8 dBm or 89,000. But a wonderful radio, best-selling radio ever, I think, for HF. And hands up, who's got a 7300? Yeah, look at that, eh? That's just great, yeah. So you not, not go wrong buying one of these. And they're really quite good on an expedition. You would think they would fall to bits with a raging pileup, but they don't, uh, they cope quite well. Not, not as well as the K3, but they're pretty good. Um, uh, uh, moving on, in 2019, Ellicraft made a, a very bad marketing um, misstep. They, I had a visit from K1ZE, Ed, who's in the Yankee Clipper Club, and he brought me a beautiful color brochure for a K4. And he said, I says, I was says to him, are people buying these K4s? And he said, no. Nope. He said, the Americans are not buying K4s. They're too expensive. You need to buy add-on all these bits. And they've not really got it developed properly. So I put a sign beside it, <laughs> which indicates my opinion of the K4. Um, it, in 2019, Yuzu brought out this radio, these pair of radios. Initially, the 101 MP had a lot of troubles, troubles with the 50-volt supply being quite unreliable. But I think they've cracked that. And they're very nice radios. I've had one for about two years now, and I really like it. Very, very quiet compared to the K3. K3 is very good internal noise generator. It's got this absolutely worthless feature, this 3D <laughs> display thing. All these bells and whistles, you'd have to be very naive to want to have that thing. But its basic radio transform uh, performance is excellent, especially close in. In a busy 80-meter band, you on CW, you can get about 200 hertz away from someone and not have any trouble with them. Hands up, who owns 101s? Two, Fred. Uh, two? Yeah. That is Fred. And you're trying to tell me you've only got 28? Uh, other transceiver? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, a great radio, a very quiet receiver, lots of bells and whistles that you can press buttons till you're blue in the face. Just great. Um, this is the architecture of the 101D or 101MP. They've got two virtually identical radios in the one box, and they just use one part to uh, drive the display. So this is a hybrid SDR. In other words, it's got an old-fashioned, if you want to call it that, front end with a mixer and a local oscillator, and then it goes on to a uh, narrowband direct sampling SDR once you've, once you've limited the signal and got it under control. Anyone sleeping? Let's nearly there in the middle row. Nearly. Who, who's sleeping up the back? Jim? John? Who is it? GMC POI. <laughs> no. No. no, hang on a minute. He was very vocal during uh, the last talk. Uh, Clive, are we awake on this frequency? Is he still asleep? No, in, on, second, on second thoughts, let's not wake him up. Uh, <laughs> right. So here we go. Um, so, right, uh, Yuzu decided that they'd got a great selling product, so they, they did a sort of downsizing and produced the FTDX10 single receiver. Hands up, who's got a FTDX10? No one, interesting. No, quite a lot of 101s, but no DX10s, okay. Uh, again, an excellent radio, ideal for um, an expedition, just a single receiver, but you can work lots of stations with just one receiver going with it. Up in Inverness, for some reason, the local boys have been buying these. They're made in Siberia by two guys, and the logo down the bottom, 599 Lab, has suddenly uh, added three words. They've suddenly added the words made for peace uh, in recent weeks, which seems to me somewhat strange. But <laughs> they're, they're beautiful radio inside, lots of uh, very narrow radio, very thin, and uh, really excellent, all sorts of features, really nice. Um, whether we'll be able to get them in future is another matter. You don't think so, Alan? I, I read some of these not in the shops anymore. In the UK? All right, the UK importers stopped importing them. Yeah. Fair enough, okay. But lovely wee radio, uh, ideal for SOTA or anything like that. And that's probably the latest technology if we're thinking about receiver technology. Okay, um, moving on. Here's the top of the, the charts uh, for Sherwood Engineering uh, in terms of receiver performance. And over at the right hand, second from the right, is the only column you really need to worry about. That's dynamic range, narrow spacing. And the, the 101D and the FTDX10 are pretty well up there. I'd have to scroll a wee bit down to find the ICOM 7610. Who's got ICOM 7610s here? Right. Oh, sorry, sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, this, uh, uh, sympathies. <laughs> Sympathy. So if you're going to buy a radio, Take a look at this chart, and you'll be surprised how far down some of the well-known second-hand radios, you know, like the FT1000 FT MPs, well down. Only one what? Well, it's about the only parameter you need in a heavy-duty <laughs> contest, to be honest. Uh, okay. If you can't hear the stations because they're too close in, you can't work them. And uh, that's the main thing. So forget all the bells and whistles. Uh, Concentrate on the, the spacing. There's the block diagram for the 101D. And uh, it's horrible to think about it going wrong. I don't know what I would do. I would be very sad. <laughs> no, that's your policy, Fred. Uh, so very, very complicated with lots of firmware, etc. Now, there is nothing's without a cost. Uh, digital signal processing introduces delay. Software-defined radios introduce a delay. And sometimes I notice with my 101, when I go back to receive on CW, the guy's already sent a dot or a dash. And I think, oh, hang on, that must be my receiver. What do we mean by delay? I'll just let you read this. Latency is one factor. In other words, the time between the RF microvolts arriving at the antenna socket and the corresponding audio signal leaving the loudspeaker. So that's your latency. And then there's a turnaround time. If you think about it, these modern radios are crammed with electronics, lots of buffers and 
mm, things to change state, and it does take a finite time. And here's a bit about from the guy at Apache Labs who writes the code for the Flex products. In latency, that's the time for the signal to travel through the radio, is defined by the shape of the filter. And you obviously want a sharp filter, so the poorer the filter, the quicker the signal passes through the radio. The better the filter, the longer it takes to be processed and emerge at the loudspeaker. Yeah. So again, it's a, a trade-off of things. The 7300 has much lower latency than any flex radio, and the worst shape factor for lower latency is about 58 milliseconds, and the flex 6600M has really long latency if you've got the best shape factor selected in all your options. We're nearly finished. Anybody else sleeping? I'm looking around eagle-eyed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for... <laughs> we'll remind him of that when he wakes up. I'm nearly finished. Um, nothing comes without problems. Uh, the 101 does not have an AGC slope control like the way the K3 has. On the K3, you can adjust the threshold where the AGC starts acting, and uh, you can adjust the slope of the AGC. The 101 does not have it. We, we've we sent various messages to Yezu headquarters in Japan. We got it translated into Japanese and very clearly explained by a Japanese person asking for this at the next firmware iteration. But it's maybe not so easy. These 101s are designed for American easy listening. In other words, you don't want QSB. You want your mate Joe out in Arkansas to be S9 all the time. So I thought I would test my 101 and just see what the AGC is doing. Now, this is a pretty crude test. The RF signal generator is from 1975. It's a Hewlett Packard 8360 or something. But it's, it's got a very good step attenuator, pretty accurate. I fed it into the 101. I used some software with the uh, audio codec and some um, level meter called Digital Level Meter 1.9. So a very crude setup, which gives me a rough idea of how the AGC is performing. By no means accurately, uh, not necessarily accurate. And these are the results. So from, I'll just summarize them, roughly from minus 90 dBm up to minus 30 dBm, the audio output's pretty well the same. And that is definitely not what we want for a pileup working or for... A uh, load of stations calling. You want to try and separate them out a bit. Yeah. And the K3 is pretty good at separating them out because of that AGC slope facility. What, what does this mean on a graph? I'll just let you absorb that for a minute. It's very sensitive, the 101D, and it's a very quiet receiver. Excellent. I love it. And uh, it's got this VC tune thing, which seems like a wee bit of a gimmick. Might be useful for blotting out a broadcast station, but I've only used it twice. It, you hear a whirring sound. I think it's designed to impress owners. It whirs. Okay, this is really the graph that we sent to Japan, to Yezu, Japan. Whether it reached the right people, I don't know. No idea. So the green line is what we want. In other words, the x-axis is RF input. So R as the RF signal increases, you want some sort of increase in the audio corresponding to that. The red line is the actual response that the Japanese engineers have taken great pride and time in creating. In other words, the, over a certain range, the AGC uh, brings it all up to the same audio level, which is not what we want for contesting and for DXing even in a pileup. You want to separate the signals out as much as you can. So we sent that off to Japan, and we're very hopeful that in the next firmware they might do something. They might not. At least they'll have plenty RAM inside the, the machine to, to make changes to the firmware. Because some of the early SDR radios had very little elbow room for changes. Thank you for watching. And I wonder if there's <laughs> any questions. <laughs> it's not I don't know, uh, Terry, I, I just don't know. The Americans are not very impressed by them. Uh, does, uh, has anyone s seen a K4 in action, George? 
I'm the only thing. Who has who? Yes. Really? Is he uh, an old? Is he a very old American? <laughs> He's what? All oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it's good. I think the problem is the development time's been so long. You know, they've taken years to bring it to market, and that always makes people suspicious of of what might be issues that they haven't identified. Anyway, thank you for listening. Are we all right for time, Jeff? They wanted me to tell some jokes, uh, so stand-up <laughs> comedy style, but I, won't, I can't. Um, any questions? Uh, did anybody? <laughs> My favourite radio, the KW2000 Duck Egg Blue. Isn't she a beauty? Gee, look at that. They don't make radios with... Oh, yeah. They do. Who cares about the performance? It's beautiful. <laughs> you have it in your shack with a light shining on it. Fred, what's your favourite radio of your 45 radios that you've got? Drake Separate, yeah, T4B and the T R X R4B, TX4B. Yeah. Any other questions, Kerry? Sorry, sorry. Uh, Kerry. Chris, how long how long's the 101 been out, Chris? A couple of years, is it? What's maybe. That? The FTDX 101. Um, 2019, I think. Okay, yeah. So three, 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 two and a half. I think anyone who's operated one or looked at one and see that the scope averaging is a problem, yeah? That, that was identified pretty early on. Yeah, have done nothing about it at all. If you look at a 7610 uh, scope and you look at the 101 scope next to each other, there's just absolutely no comparison. The yeah. Yesu looks really poor. And I don't know how many... You must have read about this, Don. So many yeah. people have reported that on so many forums, but Yesu haven't touched it, so... I don't know how much luck you're going to have with the AGC change. Uh, hang on a minute. Is this going to affect how many stations you work? What? You no. won't? You <laughs> no. No. Is it in all that rain that you're looking at, when you look at the ASU scope, you can't see much of the weak signals. It's just I don't bother looking away. at the scope. I'm too busy working the stations. Fair comment. Yeah. <laughs> what, best speaker ever, by the way, Chris. Thanks very much. <laughs> 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 Any final questions? Any any other questions? Hello, who's that? Hi. Terry, you're not allowed to ask another question. Chris, um, one of the talks you did when you'd been on an expedition to the Pacific, you said you're using FT450s and you really like them. No, we had we had one FT450 and then we replaced it with a 7300. The right. These are budget radios. Yeah, that and that's why I was surprised because you yeah, said you'd they, take them They do them. work. You know, if you're out on an island and you've got nothing else, you work an awful lot of stations <laughs> with a, an FT450. <laughs> But they are really a budget radio. Yes, they're right. budget radio, but the, their performance is good enough. Because you don't have a five-element monobander up at 80 feet, you're using compromised sort of low-gain antennas that generally don't overload the right. way they would if you put them on. You're allowed to speak now, Tom. Have you any questions? <laughs> I've, silenced, I've silenced GM4 FDM. Could, could I just come back on that? I've managed to grab hold of the microphone at last. Um, Chris? Chris, still, still talking about the, the FT450. Yes. Um, I should just say that the world leading ever de expedition, which was T32C, only used FT450s. <laughs> There's a reason for this, because the radios we actually <laughs> shipped in the container never got there, but we used 450s and we did 217,000 QSOs, was it? Something like that. Well, so, so it's amazing what you can do with a budget radio. We I were absolutely astonished. I, I'm astonished at how good that link was. <laughs> <to> <laughs>